Well, um, I don't think we're there yet, but I but I don't think on the basis of the time he would have, his temperament, or his ability to build a team. You know, Trump is kind of a, a one-man show, and his team-building ability, I don't think, is enough to solve the problem either. But the punchline of that is if Kennedy can't do it, for whatever reason, politics gets in the way, we still have to get whatever that cabal is out of power immediately. This could not be more of an emergency. We've seen through COVID how dangerous these people are, how little they care about our well-being, and we have to rally around whatever it is that addresses this problem. And, um, you know, as much as I'm not a believer that Trump on his own can do the job, I would far prefer him to another standard bearer of that cabal. The cabal is too dangerous. And I say this, as you know, I'm a lifelong Democrat, right? This is my party that I'm telling you cannot be trusted with governance. But that's where we are. The border crisis. Mm -hmm. So you went and saw the migration. You saw the groups of people that are making their way up through. Yeah, I was uh, invited. Actually, my son and I, my son Zach, and I went to Panama. Panama, where I have some history. Uh, I did my bat work on Barrow, Colorado Island in uh, Gatun Lake, the Panama Canal. So Panama is a place I, I'm familiar with, but Michael Jan invited us down to go look at the migration in the Darien province of Panama, which is the province bordering Colombia. Um, as you probably know, there's a gap in the Pan American Highway about 60 miles that were never built. Um, and this highway that otherwise stretches from Prudhoe Bay, Alaska to the southern tip of South America. And what's there is a uh, tremendously significant and very difficult jungle in the Darien Gap. So there's a national park there. And ordinarily, people do not cross the Darien Gap. It is a famously difficult obstacle. And what we see there is that the international community is encouraging a massive migration of people from South America into Central America, and that almost all of those people are ending up crossing our southern border and entering the U.S. The ones who are questioned are claiming political asylum, which is uh, not accurate. So we talked to many, many migrants, and um, the universal story amongst the migrants who would talk to us is that they were fleeing um, bad economic conditions in the direction of what looks like greater opportunity. They've been told by the international community that they should come across the Darien Gap, where many of them are not surviving the trek. It's extremely dangerous. Uh, and they are migrating north. Now, the really troubling thing, though, is that that migration is familiar in one way. It looks a little bit like the migrations of Central Americans that migrated north when we were kids. But there is another migration. There is a migration of Chinese immigrants that looks different, feels different, and is being housed in a totally separate way in Darien for reasons that are not in any way obvious. Now, I don't know exactly what to make of that. I have hypotheses. There are no more than that. Um, but the Chinese migration is uh, not forthcoming about why it is migrating. It is composed mostly of young, military-aged men. There are some women present, but it's not 50-50 by far. And the international community has arranged separate encampments. The Chinese are in many cases traveling a separate way across the Darien Gap. They're skipping some of the worst parts of it, uh, traveling by boat. And um, as I think I mentioned, they are, when asked where they're from, where they're going, why they're going, they are uninterested in talking. There's a hostility to it that I found shocking. Because for one thing, if you imagined uh, folks from almost anywhere in the world were heading to the U.S. because they didn't like the way things were in China, they feared their government, they thought that there was economic opportunity, they would be curious about Americans. These are soon to be their countrymen. They would tend to be interested in talking. 
And even if they, for some reason, because they had lived under a totalitarian regime, felt that they couldn't talk, they wouldn't be broadcasting hostility. They would be ambivalent or something. And that is not the impression that they leave when interacting with them. So I found that utterly alarming. And I came to wonder if the migration of people coming up from South America, many of whom, by the way, are not South American, are people coming from the Middle East. We met Afghans, people from Iran, Yemen, all over the world. They land in Ecuador, which has no visa requirement, and then they migrate through Colombia into Central America, straight up to the U.S. But in any case, that massive migration seems to provide a, a cloak for this other migration from China, which is nothing if not mysterious. Whew. Why are they letting it happen? Why Whew. do you think the government is allowing the border to be so porous? And why are they resisting when Texas tries to do something about it? Well, I, all, I always worry when we're trying to understand what's happening and, it, and the, the information is not being shared with us. You have to ask yourself the question of how many things, how many separate things are in play, right? Before I went to, to Panama, I thought there was a migration of people. Now I think there are, there are two. One of them's clearly a migration and the other one could well be an invasion. So if I know that there are two things, then I can put them in two categories and I can ask myself the question, why is this being allowed and why is that being allowed? The consensus, eh, maybe consensus is too strong, but the belief amongst many who have been on the story of the migration for years now is that this is a ploy to create voters, democratic voters. And I don't think that's impossible. I think that's probably playing a role. I don't know how realistic it is. I don't know whether or not it is clear that uh, migrants necessarily carry the, uh, the likelihood of voting blue that the blue team imagines. But anyway, I think that that's a plausible explanation in part, but I don't think it, it really covers it. There are other hypotheses that are darker. There is talk about the possibility of trading citizenship for military service. I think that's a very frightening prospect, but I didn't invent the idea. It has been discussed, and the problem is that to the extent that we saw things like the vaccine mandate drive out the skeptics from the military, this process would also bring in a lot of people into military service who would have more reason to follow immoral orders than uh, a citizen soldier who had been American their whole life. In other words, if the, uh, if the power structure is granting you citizenship, which you want, in exchange for your obedience, then what is it that would cause you to say no? So if you wanted to force that was capable of um, acting on behalf of tyranny against Americans, then a force that doesn't have a deep history with the rights of being an American, that doesn't have a long-standing allegiance to people within the country, that force would be uh, potentially more compliant. And that worries me. That deal. should worry you. I, I didn't, you really didn't consider that until you just said that. But my thought about this idea of the military turning on the citizens was always, but the military is citizens. And many of them are deeply patriotic and unlikely to do something like that. But if they did swap out immigrants and they did do that, holy shit. This is exactly... Then you have a real coup. This is what spooks me, is that in thinking about the various scenarios five years ago, even three years ago, I would have said... I fear that somebody is going to issue immoral orders to the military, but I'm convinced that the military will divide over them, that there are those who will, who will carry out immoral orders and there are others who won't. And at the same time, there's a senator, I think, from Massachusetts 
that introduced a bill to ban what they call paramilitary training, which is just training with firearms, like to get better at them. Right. So the idea is you 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 have a right to keep and bear arms, but you can't be good at them because you can't practice. So if you imagine in my naive state a few years ago, the idea was, well, you have a very well-armed populace. You have a military that's likely to be divided about immoral orders. I don't like the sound of that, but I don't think that it's a slam dunk that the tyrants win because the, mili- the part of the military that's not going to follow immoral orders and the citizenry that will fight to defend the republic, that's a pretty powerful force. But then you have vaccine mandates, which force out most of the people who are independent-minded from the military. And then you have the idea that migrants might be granted citizenship uh, in exchange for military service. And Has that been introduced anywhere, or is this just a complete hypothesis? No, it's not a, it's not a hypothesis. Actually, maybe, Jamie, you could look it up. I don't want to slander anybody, but yes, I believe it has been raised uh, by at least one senator. Jesus Christ. Um, No, 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 no. The other thing, the thing about um, granting citizenship to illegal immigrants in in exchange for military service. So, in any case, um, I did not... It took a lot of thinking about different pieces of the puzzle to begin to wonder about something like this. But having wondered about it, it doesn't disappear from my mind as, oh, that's just simply crazy. Actually, this, given the number of things that don't add up, this begins to explain them in, you know, a reasonably parsimonious way. And it it has me worried. But that is not inherently, in fact, it is probably not the same thing as what would explain the concentration of Chinese migrants. Right. Right. The Chinese migrants presumably have left China with the knowledge of their government. The bias of that group in favor of males is something we can talk about if, if you want to, but it has a you know an obvious interpretation. And that ought to frighten us as well. Right? So at the same How many are we talking about? Is there an estimate of how many military-aged Chinese men have gotten into the country? Now, I'm always hesitant at this point in the conversation because what I saw is what one person looks at through their eyes. So I'm in no position to estimate that. But I believe we are talking about tens of thousands. Certainly, when we're talking about the entire migration, we are talking about millions. And the number that is flowing through uh, Central America, you know, the flow-through rate in a given day is many thousands. So um, it's hard to know, and I would I would want somebody who was in a position to look at an estimate, not just a you know a spot check. To... So if the tyrannical government is playing some long game of chess, these are the pieces they would be Close moving. Could find out that number. Chinese immigrants who entered the U.S. without authorization in 2023, it's over 30,000. Look at how low it was in 2021. Yep. And how high it is in 2023. What's the source on this? Uh, this is U.S. Customs and Border Protection. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and that's probably a low estimate. You know, it's probably like bears. Um, when I was looking up the other thing about the military, I couldn't, I think you have to have a green card first. Oh, then they give them a green card. But that's also, this also was talking about the numbers are down for the Air Force, the Army. Yeah, for everybody. They're actually asking people who retired to come back. 